actually Buddha palm and fist are the same origin. Left hand Buddha palm, right hand Buddha fist. Hey guys, what's up? So we're back on this topic again, <laughs> and basically the reason why we're back on this topic again is generally because of two basic reasons. One. It's because as much as I tried to be thorough in the last video I did on this topic, I'm realizing now that as much as I was hoping I did a good job, I didn't. I mean, I think I did a good job of thoroughly, well, not as thorough as I'd like, going more into depth about why I have the stance I do. But notice how long that video was? As long as that video, as long as the video was, there were still many more points that I needed to bring up that I didn't get a chance to bring up. And I was like, you know what, this video is already getting too long, let me cut it off here. But I should have gone into those points, because I think if I had gone into the points that I'm about to get into now, it would make even more sense why I have the stance I do when it comes to the terms internal and external martial arts. And you'll begin to realize exactly why I think my stance is pretty concrete, because the points that I should have brought up really do paint a very reasonable picture here of like, this isn't just conjecture or... Um, this isn't just my opinion, let's just put it that way. This is something that's based on historical and historically contextual facts and nothing to do with just how I feel about the topic. So th this video is going to go more into that and you'll see what, what, I'm, what I mean. The other reason is because under that last video, I basically am got into a conversation with someone who believes that I am generally wrong in my view that there is no difference between internal and external arts. And I don't really mind anybody disagreeing with me on any topics that I put up on YouTube. It's happened many times before. And I'm always open to the possibility that I'm wrong. It has happened a couple of times, not that often, but it has happened a couple of times where I pointed out something and someone's like, nah, you, you're forgetting this or you didn't bring up that or actually this and, I'm, and I get educated on the subject and that's freaking fantastic. I welcome that. The only thing that makes me get frustrated is when someone is insisting that I'm wrong but then they don't really present anything to counter what I bring up. Which even that in and of itself, if the person's not being hostile about it, I just like whatever and I let it go and I trust that somebody who is either reading the conversation or in the conversation can see that for themselves but it's another thing when not only did they not bring up anything to fully counter what I'm saying like actual proof like I go into depth you may notice in these videos which tend to go long I'm sorry and in my posts in the comment sections which also tend to go really long and I understand that can be frustrating to some people I try to go into depth in my answers and try to come up with examples and points and facts and things to try to back up my claims. I don't just simply go, oh, you're wrong and I'm right. I try to like, or just say, oh, you just don't know anything about it. Now I try to go into it and go, this is why I'm saying what I'm saying because of this and that and that and this and this and that and that and this. And I expect anybody who's going to be saying I'm wrong to do the same thing and I'm not getting that. And that's frustrating. And it's even more frustrating when then the very things that I am having a problem with in an argument or a topic are brought up again despite the fact that I've proven that there's a problem with it. So, in that conversation, after seeing something about, basically, the, the latest thing in the comment section, I read something which made me go, I just showed that there, you can't, if, if I'm saying that there is no difference, fundamentally, between internal and external arts, and the only thing you can say is quote unquote different is how they begin their training, but at the end of the, because like, you know, one school starts with power issues training and then goes on to techniques or the other schools start with technique and then get into more efficient ways of contributing power. But at the end of the day, they still incorporate hard and soft body training and hard and soft power in their training. When I've explained that and pointed out that you can see examples of this in every single last martial school, there is hard and soft training in all of them to then go and say, oh, he doesn't really understand these arts because he doesn't understand there's a difference between internal and external arts or in internal and external training, Negong and, and Weigong, I just stated that both the, both so-called external and internal have both Weigong and, 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 and um, Negong in there. So when you then state, oh, well, there's a difference between Negong and Weigong. I'm not disputing there's a difference between Negong and Weigong. I'm saying that any Chinese martial art worth its salt has elements of both in its training. 
So when you say that, oh, there's a difference between them, you're then ignoring what I've already pointed out. If you're saying, well, he doesn't understand the difference between Nagong and Wagong, then you're essentially saying that only internal schools have Nagong and, and external schools have Wagong, which I already pointed out is wrong. So what I'm going to do now, I was going to just explain all that and the points I'm about to bring up, and these are my notes. I had to go back into my computer and go into all my... Because I research this stuff. It's, it's something I like doing. I don't just study martial arts. I try to study the history of it, how it developed, who the masters were, the historical context. I try to study Chinese history, and my hard drive is full of stuff. <laughs> full of stuff. And my bookshelf got, has a lot of stuff on these topics. And I had to try to condense all this down, and I got a bunch of notes here that I'm going to try to sift through. And I was originally going to put this in the comment section, but then I would have ended up with a really, really long post. And I know many people just get frustrated having to read through a freaking novel in the comment section. I know you guys don't have time for that. So I decided, you know what, F this. I'm just gonna put it in the video. So here's the video, this is the second reason. See how long it took me just to get there? I'm sorry. <laughs> this is actually my fourth take because the other videos I've tried to do on this have gotten really long. The last, the first one was 40 minutes. And since then I've gotten it like around 30 to around 27 minutes. I'm trying to make it shorter than that. And I don't know how well I'm going to succeed with this one, but I will try because I'm getting tired of recording this over and over. I wasted enough time. Here we go. Let's get into this. Why I think what I think. Sum it all up for anybody who's just jumping in. There are different classification methods for Chinese martial arts. And pretty much all of them have problems. And one of the ones that has problems is the internal and external classification. Generally, they claim that internal arts happen to be all about internal power and, 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 and chi and external arts are just simply pugilistic and just depend on brute strength and that's BS. It's wrong. And I main, and I will I maintain that is that's wrong. And I'm going to go further into why I think it's wrong. I will state this, however, and I did not state this in the other videos and I should have. If one is going to be using this definition at for internal and external and then classifying it that way, then yeah, I have a problem with it. For reasons I'm going to, I've already gotten into and I'm going to go into for it further here. However, if you're using the terms internal and external to talk about one's level of mastery in a martial art, I think then you might actually have an argument. You might have a case. If somebody is who's beginning a martial art, you know, they're just simply doing the basic physical movements and they don't know how to per properly use their body efficiently to apply the, mo the moves and understand the deeper aspects of how to power their blows, then yeah, you can say they just have an external understanding of it. But if you later on say that, oh, this person really, like, they barely touched me and I went flying. Or this guy just did a subtle movement and I was just like, now you're looking at some, and then this person's also able to do a technique in a variety of different ways and fully, like, really deeply understand the essence of his martial art. Now you're talking about internal development. Now it's, oh, that guy, he understands it internally. That I can understand. But let's get into it. If you're going to try to understand why I have a particular problem with this term, we need to first start with when these terms, internal and external, were first coined. When's the earliest that we can see in Chinese martial arts history do we see these terms being used? Now, Chinese martial arts is thousands of years old. Thousands, okay? Considering how long that is, you would expect, if there was some validity to the terms internal and external arts, and, you know, that there's a fundamental difference between the two, that we would see this relatively early in its history. It doesn't necessarily need to be at the start of it because, you know, after all, fighting is a rather basic thing to do and deeper techniques can take some time to develop. But 17th century? That's fairly late in... That's getting into the late period of Chinese martial arts history. If the earliest that we can see these terms being used is the 17th century, that's questionable. And it's about to get even more questionable. First person that we can see who mentioned these terms is a guy who goes by the name Huang Zhongshi. Don't worry, I got the text right there so you guys can see the names I'm trying to mention. Now, Huang Zhongshi was a scholar and a philosopher. And he also was like someone that I guess you can call like a super patriot. He's like, you know, like somebody who's all about, you know, like everything needs, you know, be unique. You got to be Chinese, you know, like, you know, exemplifying Chineseness and anything foreign is lesser than and, and that sort of thing. And you got to like live up to the Chinese spirit, be a true Chinese man, you know, like that, that sort of thing. 
And he wrote a lot of, you know, he wrote a lot of works and a lot of essays and stuff on these topics, trying to strengthen the Chinese, you know, culture and all that. Notice what I didn't mention. Martial arts. He's not known for that. No, he's not. He, in fact, he most likely wasn't a martial artist. He was a scholar and a philosopher and something of an activist. But he was not a noted martial artist. No. But he's the first person to coin the terms internal and external martial arts. And what he had to say about the internal arts in particular is that they were better than the external ones. And that the internal arts can be attributed to a man by the name of Zhang Senfang. Now, if you know anything about Chinese history, well, let's just say Chinese martial arts history, you know that name. Because it's a name that's attributed to internal martial arts and the foundation of Wudan Temple. He is a guy who supposedly was the one who created Tai Chi Chuan. After, you know, he was an, a master of so-called external arts from Shaolin, but then it somehow damaged his chi, and then one day he happened to nose a snake and a crane fighting, and then that's how he learned Tai Chi. Well, Mr. Huang here goes a little bit further into that. He claims that this guy, Zhang Zhenfeng, got his internal martial arts skills. They were transmitted to Zhang by the god of war while Zhang was sleeping. I'll repeat that for you. Huang Zhongsi claims that the internal arts, which are superior to external ones, according to him, they were transmitted to Zhang Shenfeng by the god of war while Zhang was sleeping. Yeah. You can see why I say we have problems. First problem. Anyone who studied Chinese martial arts history for even a brief amount of time will know that claiming that Zhang Zhenfeng created these arts or is the originator of these arts is bullshit. Excuse my language, but that's what it is. There is no historical facts whatsoever linking Zhang Zhenfeng to these arts at all. In fact, there is no real evidence to link any of these so-called internal arts Tai Chi Chuan, Ba Gua Zhang, Xing Yi, Le He Ba Fa. None of these particular arts can be linked to Wudang. No matter what the latest dude in long hair and white robes is telling you. It's not true. Tai Chi Chuan is linked back to Cheng Village. okay, And the basic movements can be linked back to a fighting manual developed by a general named Qi Ji Guan who used it to train his militia. So that's military origins, not esoteric ones. Ba Guazhang is attributed to Dong Hai Chuan, who, while he was pretty evasive in where he learned his arts from, he's claimed so many things just to keep the people off his tail. And I'm thinking the main reason why he did that, and several other historians are thinking the same thing, is because in China, if you just say you invented something yourself, culturally at that time, they were like, ah, then how do I know it's any good? But if you linked it to like a Taoist immortal or something, then people took it seriously. And I'm thinking that's what he did. Dong Wai Chuan was a bodyguard, okay? He was someone who had to know how to work with his hands for a living. He's the founder of Ba Gua Zhang. And the students he trained, who ended up making their own versions of Ba Gua Zhang, um, Yin Fu style, for instance. Yin Fu, he was a long fist exponent. Um, Cheng Tinghua, who founded Cheng Style Ba Gua, was a wrestler who was well known for his fighting prowess, physical fighting prowess, not deep meditational thinking prowess. <laughs> I'm going too long on this, let me sum up. And then Xing Yi, though, I gotta get into this. Xing Yi was developed by a dude named Li, I don't remember his full name, but Li, um, that guy was a spear fighter who, with a military background who used his spear techniques to formulate Xing Yi Juan. None of this is linked back to Wudang at all. So, yeah, we got a problem here. And then also linking this, and the second problem is you're linking this all to myth that's been disproven. And this is being coined by a guy who wasn't a martial artist and who definitely did not have access to the training, um, martial training regimens of monks or priests in Wunan or Shaolin. So there was no real way he'd be able to know whose style was more superior, quote unquote. So already, this is throwing the whole internal and external definitions into question. If the earliest we can see of it is being mentioned by a guy who, for all we can tell, 
had no real martial skills and was basically linking it to a lot of myth and BS, that has basically been disproven. Now, I will say this as an aside, and I think it also bears some research on this. Huang Zhongshi may not necessarily have been talking about martial arts exclusively when he was talking about external and internal arts. Some historians are arguing that he might instead have been talking about schools of thought. You got to remember, the internal arts in the Zhongshan Feng is, for better or worse, linked to Wudan. Well, what is Wudan a center of, besides supposedly internal arts? Taoism. Taoism, a philosophical uh, religious practice in China, which was developed in China, internal. Whereas Shaolin is the center of what school of thought and religion? Buddhism, which came from the West, from India. Okay, external. And this guy is claiming, remember what I said about um, Mr. Huang? All about Chinese, be uniquely Chinese, Chinese stuff is best. Super patriot. What is he claiming? The internal arts are better than the external ones. This might have been more about, hey, those guys, they learned some stuff from outside. It's foreign. It's not nearly as good as the stuff that came from us. That could be what he was arguing. That's what some historians are arguing anyway. So, and, and, and also keep in mind that, you know, to kind of go along with this whole thing about Chinese is best, even Buddhism in China is altered. It's not exactly practiced the same way as it is in India. Remember, they, they, what they practice over there is Chan Buddhism, and Chan Buddhism is pretty much just Taoist, it's like Buddhism with Taoist thought mixed in. So, and, and, and I'm speaking in very, very general terms here, but that is generally what it is. So, some more food for thought for you guys. Anyway, this has gone long. I need to move on. I got more points to bring up. The next time we see the term internal arts or nesia being popularized and expressed is many years later by Sun Lutang and his contemporaries. Now we have to mention Sun Lutang when it comes to the whole talking about internal and external arts, because if it wasn't for him, modern day thinking and modern, like what we talk about when we talk about internal arts today, none of that language would have existed if it wasn't for this man. This guy started all that, him and many of the people around him. Now Sun Lutang, if you don't know who he is, and I'd be, if you know about Chinese martial arts and you don't know who he is, I would be very surprised. This guy was a martial arts, I'm going to say martial arts master. I personally think the guy must have known what he was doing. But there are some people who don't think he was all that great, and I'll get into that later. But Sun Lutong, he's the founder of Sun Style Taiji. And he supposedly also mastered Bagua Zhang and Xing Yi. And he did have guys who taught him that stuff. He and several other contemporaries during the late 1800s and early 1900s started teaching and opening up large schools teaching these arts to people and also writing a lot of books and stuff on these arts. Now, Sun Wutong was a rarity in the Chinese martial arts world. The reason why I say he was a rarity is because he was a scholar and a philosopher. Hey, a lot like Huang Zhongshi. How about that? But unlike Huang Zhongshi, Sun Wutong practiced martial arts and had access and was friends with other martial artists. So he actually had a martial arts background. That made him rare. And the reason why I say that makes him rare is because if you look throughout the history of the martial arts world, you will find that many, most martial arts masters, especially during the heyday of Chinese martial arts, they weren't deep thinkers. They, they weren't. Martial arts back then was viewed the same way that we look at stuff like wrestling and boxing and MMA and, and like shooting and hunting today. They're physical skills. And I'm not saying that people who practice these things today aren't smart. Yeah, there's plenty of people with high educations, but for the most part, you don't really link high thinking and philosophy to stuff like boxing and, you know, and wrestling. And consider that I'm talking about stuff that today we see as sports or entertainment or as a hobby. Back then, martial arts was something that you used to put food on the table, okay? It was either something you did because you were in the military or something you did because you were running an escort service. Not that kind of escort service. Or, you know, you were a bandit, or you were opening up a school, something like that. It was a skill you did with your hands, quite literally. Deep thinking was, hell, most of these people weren't even educated. They didn't even know how to read, okay? That's what made Sun Lutong different. 
Now, this is very important because at the time period that he was teaching and spreading his thoughts on Chinese martial arts was a time of a lot of political upheaval in China. Okay, the Qing Dynasty was falling, or had already fallen, depending on what time period you're looking at when he was teaching. And later on, like he started spreading, like like really um, started spreading his stuff and getting students around. I think it was around 1894. It was definitely the 1800s. And then later in the late 1800s, all the way up until like 19 something, I think it was 1911. I'll look it up and put it in the text. You had the Boxer Rebellion. And the Boxer Rebellion did a lot of damage to the reputation of Chinese martial arts, which was already at a low point during that time period. I mean, you already had foreign powers coming in and shooting people in the head, and martial arts didn't seem to be doing anything to work with that. And they were already being linked to low-level people. And then to make matters worse, then you had the Boxer Rebellion, which, for all intents and purposes, I mean, yeah, there were a lot of high-minded Chinese um, patriots who were trying to fight off the foreigners, but a great deal of boxing, of the boxers were backwoods people with no educations and who had a whole lot of superstitions, who believed in things like magic talismans and special breathing techniques to make them impervious to bullets. Spoiler alert, they lost. And the image of the martial artist was lower than ever. Now, when you're reaching around the early 1900s and you got the Republican era of China popping up, China was looking at the rest of the world and going, man, we really need to do something to kind of improve our image because we're looking like losers. You got foreign powers coming in and taking over parts of our land. You, you know, we're getting, you know, we've got a bunch of like our traditional thinking is being viewed as superstitious and unscientific. Japan, a country, a tiny little island country that used to look up to us, who considered us to be like superior. Now they're looking better than we are. They've modernized and, and they got their people like, you know, they, the Chinese had people going over to Japan to see what they were doing to be stronger, like to make themselves elevate themselves in the world. And they noticed that they basically reinterpreted Bushido and Budo and made it a cultural tenet for every Japanese person to follow. You know, they had Kendo being taught to the, the um, you know, young kids and, you know, you need to exemplify the, the samurai spirit. And they're like, we need to do that stuff. We need to do the same thing in China. So they went back to China instead of or, um, opening up organizations such as the Jingwu School, which is all about you need to be the strong Chinese man who is also smart and modern and scientific. And the main way they want to do is we need to have that same warrior spirit too. So we need to look to Chinese martial arts, something that's uniquely Chinese to teach to the people instead of, see, we got our own brand of, of strength here. But Chinese martial arts was considered low, like, that's what scum do. That's what the superstitious idiots do. How do you rebrand it to the population to make it palpable for them? Enter Sun Lutang. Enter his contemporaries. These guys, Sun Lutang, remember, a philosopher, highly educated, scholar, highly educated. It didn't also um, hurt that he was rich, part of a wealthy family. That also enters into it, and many of his contemporaries were also high-minded, wealthy people who were now saying, hey, we know martial arts. In fact, we, know more, uh, we don't practice the martial arts of the scum, no. We practice the internal arts. We practice the arts that are deeper in thinking and are uniquely Chinese. They were developed internally and they were developed, and we can link it to Taoist thought and thinking and we are high-minded philosophers. You need to listen to us. We know about this stuff. We can show how these practices can be linked to something uniquely Chinese and this esoteric and stuff. And, 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 and the, the higher man is what practices it. And we can teach it to you for a fee. It was marketing. Nasia and internal arts, especially at that time, was marketing. Very clever marketing, but it was marketing. And Sun Lutong excelled at that. He ended up having a very large ass school that he was teaching the people about the, the arts of Nasia, and he was doing all this stuff to link what used to be just pure pugilistic skills to esoteric breathing techniques and, and all that type of stuff. Now, this is not saying that Nasia is fake. You know, like things like Negong, Qigong, that type of stuff. I'm not saying that stuff is fake. No, these exercises do have benefits. There are some actual benefits to this stuff. And there are martial Qigong stuff out there. There's martial Nezha, um, Nezha or Negong to practice. But they were overemphasized by Sun Lutong and his contemporaries for reasons that I've already discussed. And I hate to break it to somebody who really is into these practices, but a lot of what you're practicing has no martial application whatsoever. 
Some of you guys are proud of that. Some of you guys are like, well, that, that, yeah, there are no, it's deeper than that. No, no, you don't seem to understand. No, it has no real link whatsoever to your actual martial arts skills. It's just something else you happen to practice. You may think it's linked, but it really isn't. You could practice that stuff alone and still get the same benefit from it. Like, you know, the whole thing about practicing something esoteric, working on your breathing, improving your health. These exercises were designed strictly for that, and they were just incorporated into these internal arts to make them more marketable to the people they were trying to spread them to. Actual martial arts negong is... I hate to say the term simplistic because that makes it sound like it's not deep and complex, because it is. But if, let's just put it this way, if you're focusing more on your breathing techniques than you are on your fighting skills, something's wrong. Martial Negong is martial Negong, okay? It focuses primarily on making sure that the breathing exercises you're doing and the body mechanic stuff that you're doing can be applied to fighting. You are developing the strength and body conditioning needed to make your techniques work. Stuff like Virgin Boy Qigong, stuff like the Five Animal Frolics, stuff like certain versions of the Eight, um, eight Piece Brocade, certain yogic exercises you may be practicing, the microcosmic orbits, many of those things have nothing to do with actually making you a better fighter, which is what these arts were intended to do in the first place. I know there are a lot of people going, there's more to martial arts than just fighting. Yeah, but that's a modern interpretation of it. This is something that was reinvented by Sun Lutang in the early 1900s. Before that, that's not what martial arts are for. And I hate to break it to you, essentially, they still have nothing to do with developing your actual skill and what you're doing. And to make matters worse, there are a lot of charlatans out there right now who are selling you Nasia and claiming to have special Nasia organizations that, oh yeah, we know, and then they'll have a huge list of all the stuff that they practice, which quite frankly, for the age that they are at, there's no way a 30 or 40 something year old person can master the huge list of things that they claim to have mastered and be able to teach it to you at a high level. It ain't gonna happen. Especially if they're not on the list of qualifications that they claim to have aren't just several internal arts at once, but also several external arts and yogic ones and tantric ones. And This is an open tip to anybody out there watching this right now, and especially a Westerner who is interested in practicing Chinese so-called internal arts. The guy you're learning this from is some Westerner who doesn't even have gray hairs and is claiming more than five high level things that he mastered. You may want to take what he has to say on the subject with a great deal of salt. Especially if when you actually see him move and then you compare it to somebody who's like, oh, all I practice is just Bagua. Or I just practice um, Tai Chi. I mean, I, I practice three arts at the most, and then one of them they focus the most on, and their body movement looks a lot more detailed. You may want to take a second look at the dude. What I'm saying right now is it's really got nothing to do with the topic, and I'm making this video even longer, but it's something you guys need to, because I know a lot of people who disagree with me on this are Westerners who are quoting from, or they're yelling at me because they happen to be following some dude from the West who, because he had did a couple of seminars in China, is claiming now to be a master. It doesn't work that way, guys. It doesn't. There are plenty more points that I needed to bring up, but I'm this video's gotten long enough already, and I don't want to make another 40-minute one. So let me just try to sum this up as best as I can, okay? Many of the concepts that you have that people have, you and, and I say the people who hold this view, about how internal arts are somehow completely different from external ones, are either modern concepts developed by philosophers who wanted to find a way to link certain high level thinking to what is essentially a very grounded practical skill. Or worse, they're just complete misconceptions or lies. There is, if you're gonna be talking about martial arts, purely martial arts, there is nothing in a so-called internal art that you can't get some form of in an external one and vice versa. And if we're gonna, I forgot to get into body conditioning. If we're gonna start getting into body conditioning, there is no, okay, give you an idea. Bagua Zhang, it's the art that I'm practicing. 
The body conditioning for Bagua Zhang is not all just breathing exercises and meditation and stretching yourself into knots. No. You want to know what real Bagua body conditioning is like? And this is on a fundamental level. They have, for instance, they have a two-man practice session where you and the other dude strike each other's limbs, shoulders, like you bang each other's limbs together, you bang each other's shoulders together, your chest, your back, your backside, your legs, your shins, even your head, you're bumping up against that person's chest and, and you're doing hard body conditioning because this is a martial art. You have to get used to striking and being struck. And you practice that stuff with your partner. This is fundamental training. This is ground level training. There's the post training in Bagua Zhang where you got at first one pole, wooden pole in front of you and you're striking your limbs on that pole and practicing your motions and your body checks and even your head butts against that pole. Then they move up to three poles where you're weaving in between the three poles and striking those poles. And then the nine palace formation which is nine poles and you're doing all the strikes and working on your footwork and on the body weaving and the body checks and all that type of stuff. This is fundamental training for Bagua Zhang. Nothing in it about OM. That hard body conditioning sounds a lot like external training, doesn't it? Because I know if you go to a, like a long for school or whatever, that's the type of stuff they do. Strike limbs. There's a certain, I remember, I remember a long time ago when I was doing the first classes, one of the first things we had to do was bang, 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 turn around, bang, 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 switch on, bang, bang, bang. Slam the arms together. Hitting the heavy bag. Hell, by the way, even as you sort of lifting weights, you sometimes have to do the circle walking with bricks in your hand and they increase the number of bricks as you get stronger. You gotta be stable, your muscles have to be strong to do this stuff. Xing Yi traditionally has a weight training regimen that used to be part of it. Even Tai Chi has hard body conditioning and, and weight training stuff in there. You're learning to fight. You can't be some weak person with tons of fat hanging off of you expecting to be a decent expert at Tai Chi or any of these other fighting arts. And if you think that the external arts are just about external training, again, that means your understanding of Chinese martial arts and how they train is very limited. I have yet to see any Chinese training curriculum worth its salt that didn't talk about using soft power to strike a blow and training your internal power to do that. There is no going in external arts. If they don't have their own, they incorporate it from elsewhere. And this is a common thing in Chinese martial arts history. If they don't have it themselves, they get it from elsewhere. How many schools out there, even though they're not Cha style, have a road forge um, form in their, school, in their school? Even the Jingwu Association has their own version of road form and their own version of, um, tuan, of Tan Tui. They got 12 road Tan Tui. Originally it was 10 road Tan Tui, which came from Cha style. They, they, hey, that stuff's good. That's pretty good for us to learn. I work on my technique. We need to take that. That's what they did. But other schools have their own Negong mixed in. And they all work on being able to strike through their opponent. You know, I'm realizing now this video is probably for close to 40 minutes long. And you know what? What? F it. This is the video I'm putting up. Because I have to get into this. External styles also. If anybody's believing that oh, only the internal styles try to do internal damage, you're fooling yourself. External styles have always talked about being able to damage the opponent and drive your blow through them, not just on them. You're not just trying to bruise the skin. You're not just trying to damage. No, you're trying to hurt them internally. Striking special pressure points to do internal damage. Being able to damage the guy so that when you hit them, it doesn't look like you've done any physical damage here, but inside, an organ just ruptured. They all do that. All of them train for that. When I was gone being trained, I distinctly remember being, Mark, you know, Mark, you need to make sure when you're doing the blow, you go through the, don't just hit him, hit through him, hit past them. Your blow has to have penetration power. You can't just hit them. No, it's gotta, you gotta have the right amount of Fa Jing to go through and into them. That's why you have to be, you have to be loose until the moment of impact. You can't be tense all the way through. This again is like, this is an external staple. You do not, you're not supposed to be tense and all muscled up. Like, no, you got to be loose and pliable so that the energy, or if we're going to be going into semantics, so that chi can flow. And then it shocks the person when you hit them. It shocks them internally. It, I'm ending this off with this. 
The only time I've ever seen a practical demonstration, like someone actually putting their full striking power so you actually can tell it's actual internal power being used, was done by an external exponent. And again, I'm using, I hate using those terms, but it's the only way that people understand what I mean. The guy who actually showed me a demonstration of that internal power damaging thing was done by a guy who only practiced Wing Chun. He didn't practice Tai Chi or Bagua or, or the internal stuff. He didn't breathe and meditate. He didn't do the, the eight section brocade. He didn't go to some place and learn yoga. No. It was Wing Chun. That's what he practiced. After one particular grueling session with him, it was over. We are getting done, but he's still like, you know, I still need to get going. I, you know, I still want to work on some of this energy, Mark. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to show you what you, look, what you can look forward to if you practice right. Um... We were like training in his garage and he had like, you know, wood pieces everywhere because he was working on building shelves. And he's like, yo, pick up those two boards. Like there was somebody else with us. And he's like, pick up these two boards. And he was, and the guy was holding the two boards and he's like, I'm gonna, you know, punch you the two boards. I wanna, you know, I wanna still see if I got that, that energy and I wanna show you what you do. So guy holds up the two boards and dude punches it. And by the way, he didn't do the whole, crap that you normally see people do. It was you just studied it. Pow! Just hit it. Now what was interesting was that when he hit it, the board he hit didn't break. No damage to it, not a crack, nothing. The board behind it broke. And I'm not making this up. I was there. I saw it. He hit the thing hit the two boards, the board he hit, fine. The board behind it, you heard it snap. And all of us were kind of shocked. I was like, oh, shit. Because I immediately knew what a blow like that would do to me. Whatever he hit, whatever's behind what he hit is gone. The guy holding it was like, oh, shit. And the guy who hit it was, oh, man. And I was surprised that he was shocked. But what he said cracked me up even more. He's like, I wasn't trying to hit it like that. <laughs> That's what got me the most. He had gotten so used to striking beyond the target that that was the only way he could deliver the blows now. <laughs> like, that's that, if he was going to make a hard blow and he hit, he's doing it to F you up. <laughs> external exponent normally that type of trick is usually done by guys who claim to have special internal powers this was done by a guy who was a very i'm telling you right now this was not a guy who was all about you know esoteric thinking and deep philosophies and trying to link that to his martial art no this was a dude who was all about learning martial arts you know how to fight that's what it's for and he was very grounded very down to earth when he taught it granted i mean we did talk philosophy and stuff like that but when it came to martial arts he wasn't about the BS. And I thank him to this day for that because it really helped to ground my education when it comes to this stuff. I don't fall for the BS that a lot of people fall for when it comes to martial arts. So this has gone on way too long and I apologize. I really do. If you guys had the patience to sit through this all the way through, I thank you. But I've been doing so many takes of this and I can't see to shrink this anymore. So.